Hi there, this is Glenn Young with Miar Adventures and today I'm doing a Denali preparation course uh, for people who'd like to climb Denali independently later this year. So we're going through some of the things that they're going to need to pack and it is quite an extensive packing list so I decided I'd shoot this video so that anyone who's interested in climbing Denali would have something as a reference. So we're going to start right over here at this end of the pile. Uh, First two things, super important for a climb like Denali where you might be carrying up to 70 pounds on your back and 120 to 160 pounds in your sled if you're a small team of independent climbers with a longer term expedition, like 26 to 30 days. Um, you're gonna need some trekking poles for that load. And this is what's called a black diamond whippet. Uh, it has an ice ax on the head uh, so that if you were self-arresting without the use of an ice ax but had two trekking poles, this could bite into the snow somewhat. Not as effective as an ice ax, but uh, you really don't have much of another option when in, with those kinds of loads. And then another expedition ski pole. This is a really nice one by Black Diamond because it has an insulator in the handle to keep your hands warmer. And uh, if you do have a pole like this, it's not a bad idea to put an insulator on that handle yourself um, to keep your hands warm. Uh, when you have an expedition sled as well, typically the air services will issue a Paris expedition sled. You can buy those online. They have pre-drilled holes in them. They're made for hauling large loads. They're very large. So this is a rigged up practice sled. Um, we have material for rigging it, which basically means for tying down duffel bag. We also have a piece of seven millimeter cord with knots tied in it. They can be flipped underneath the, the sled to serve as a brake. And then this is the pole strap here. Uh, it has some four millimeter cord with a bungee that's incorporated. So when you pull on it, it doesn't shock load your system as you're pulling and it reduces the, the pull on your lower back. So it makes it a little bit more comfortable over the long term. Just make sure when you do have the sled engaged to be pulled um, and you don't want the brake on that it's flipped up and tucked underneath the duffel bag. The duffel bag I'm using is no longer produced. Any large duffel bag will work. This one is produced by Columbia. It's 180 liters, so it's very big. The larger the bag you get, the better. Uh, I know Granite Gear produces some very, very large bags that are lightweight and somewhat waterproof, and that's really what you're looking for. You're looking for something very, very lightweight. This is an incredibly lightweight bag for its size, especially for the waterproofing, um, and ideally something that's waterproof and that's gonna hold up. The bag has also been rigged. Um, it's been equalized with a piece of five millimeter nylon cord. It's climbing specific cord, so that's gonna be very, very strong. Um, and it has a locking carabiner on it, and this is a prussic loop that can be attached to the um, climbing rope so that if you were to fall into a crevasse as one of the climbers on the team, the bag would hang from that prussic and not come in and hit you in the head on the way after. Okay. The backpack that I have here is a 105 liter BMG or Big Mountain Guide pack by Mountain Hardware. It's the newer version of the pack which has an out dry membrane which makes the pack mostly waterproof. Uh, some things I like about this pack is it has a pouch that I can easily access a puffy jacket from or gloves without getting inside the backpack. It has glove friendly cinches on it. And it's made specifically for people climbing big peaks with, which require the use of sleds. So there's actually some straps here that you can tie onto to uh, attach a cord that you can then clip your sled into for hauling. So I find that is really useful. Um, this pack, I have tied some webbing through around the shoulder straps and then girth hitch a piece of Dyneema runner through that to use as a, a, a tether for my pack. So if I were to fall in a crevasse, I wouldn't necessarily be able to easily prussic out of that crevasse with a huge backpack that might weigh 65, 70 pounds. So I need to take it off. So I'll unclip this um, or keep this clipped into the rope and take my backpack off and then lower that down onto the rope as carefully as I can uh, and then prussic out and we'll rescue my backpack later after I'm on the surface and nice and warm. And it's been rigged around the shoulder straps because sometimes when you're hauling, that pack might get snagged up underneath the piece of snow or ice, and there can be a lot of force, and we don't want the haul loop of the pack to tear off and me to lose the precious supplies like my puppy jackets, and maybe stove, things like that. Contractor bags, incredibly useful items. I use them for all kinds of things on Denali, including burying food caches. They're really lightweight, they're waterproof, 
You might see other people are using rice sacks for that, which also work. They're, those are a little bit more durable. When you are using these for food caches, you do have to be a little careful when you're digging down to dig your food caches out. You don't tear the bags up too much. If you do a little bit, your food should be pretty waterproof inside anyway. But it's nice to have them somewhat intact. Great for organizing. Uh, and then we're gonna move on into some of the clothing systems and then uh, later back into some of the other gear. So hands. The first time I climbed Denali, I brought a lot of handware with me because I was really concerned about staying warm. And then the next time I trimmed it down some, but I was climbing a technical route, so I still needed some good dexterity and ice routes. And now I realize I don't need nearly as much as I thought, because one thing you need to think about on Denali is you don't have a warm place you're going back to ever to dry things out. The only thing that you have to dry things with is your own body heat. If you get really lucky, maybe a nice warm day where you can put stuff up on your tent, but I wouldn't expect very many of those in the course of your expedition. So anything that you bring, if it freezes solid, it's just gonna stay froze solid. You're just gonna haul that weight around in your pack. So I've trimmed down my hand gear quite a bit since my first expedition. So I have, this is my pair of lightest weight liner gloves. It's an outdoor research product. And this uh, nests really well um, in my, on my hand with having very, very good dexterity and then also will fit inside my expedition mitt. Okay, so that if I need to adjust a crampon or something like that in conditions that are cold enough that the expedition mitt is required, I can take my hand out and not have it exposed. The amount of time that I actually use this combination on Denali is extremely small, mostly above 17,500 feet, or maybe working around camps in the evening time or crossing around Windy Corner in particularly cold conditions. But for the most part, um, this system is reserved for the very, very cold parts of that trip. The glove that I wear most of the time is the Outdoor Research Luminary Glove. It's a lightweight soft shell glove. I prefer soft shell gloves to gloves that have a waterproof liner that can't be removed or a waterproof Gore-Tex insert because those are kind of difficult to dry with body heat alone. But a soft shell glove like this, the leather palm is pretty durable and I can place it on the inside of my puffy jackets. Um, while I'm working around camp, while I'm sleeping, and wake up and it's dry. Uh, a Gore-Tex product might stay drier longer, but eventually it's gonna wet out and be even harder to dry in an expedition setting. Um, instead of having a heavyweight glove, like you find on most Denali packing lists, what I found is um, a crab claw mitt that separates. This is the Soloist by Black Diamond. And that gives me a little bit more um, versatility, I find, because there's this waterproof outer glove that is nothing more than a waterproof outer mitt, and it has a decent amount of dexterity, more so than a mitten, so I can put, say, my luminary gloves inside and have good dexterity. I oftentimes will substitute the Impulse Glove by Black Diamond for these inners, um, and that way I can actually have another functioning glove inside, and those have very good dexterity and a pretty sticky palm to work with. Um, and it's, it's great because of those two systems of the waterproof outer that can be applied to any other glove and then a more insulating inner um, that can easily be dried in my jacket. And by turning these inside out, I can dry them really easily. I find this actually has better dexterity than does like the Black Diamond Guide Glove or the LT Mitt by Outdoor Research, sorry, the LT Glove by Outdoor Research, which are the two commonly used heavyweight gloves on the mountain. Um, so I really like those. And then sometimes on Denali you actually get rain. And rain combined with snow means none of your glove systems really work well. Even a pretty waterproof outer mitt, um, even if you go to uh, the painstaking portion of waterproofing it with a sealer, will sometimes start to leak on you um, or can get wet on the inside from putting your wet hand inside and pulling them out. But these gloves, these are actually Glacier Glove. The Glacier Glove makes paddling gloves. They also make angler's gloves for fishermen. These are designed to have wet hands go inside them. They're neoprene, they're waterproof neoprene outer. And I've used these all over the place. I used a guide in Southeast Alaska, including in the winter time. And that was the only thing that would keep your hands warm in really wet conditions. So you actually want something that's non-breathable if it's really that cold and wet. Um, I rarely will use these on Denali, but there are days when it's just pouring rain, believe it or not, on the glacier. And this is the only thing that I'll put on my hands. And I'll put everything else 
inside a waterproof stuff sack, silicone nylon stuff sack, and then put it in my waterproof backpack because I want to make sure that that stays dry so I don't have to mess around with drying it when I'm on the glacier. Okay, we'll start looking at my lower body here, what I'll wear. My primary layer is a pair of soft shell pants. This is a pair of soft shell pants by our Arcteryx. I always try to choose lighter colors because uh, there's a lot of light on glaciers and if you're lucky enough to get some pretty good weather, you can get overheated, especially when you're below 11,000 feet on the lower glacier. So you have these. These do have a small amount of um, insulation. It's like a fleecy fabric on the inside. So that kind of acts like a very lightweight nylon or well, lightweight long john which most of the time on the mountain is awesome. Some of the time on the mountain it's pretty warm, but they breathe really well also. They're not, uh, they're, they don't have like a hard shell outer as much as some other types of soft shells might. So it does pretty well. It's also nice it has an instep guard for when you're with crampons or if you have ski edges around. Then I'm only bringing uh, this really lightweight pair of long johns and paired with these pants that actually makes it pretty warm. If, as I travel up the mountain, usually above 14,000 feet, or in the evening times, I might need an extra long john layer. And this is a very affordable, very lightweight micro fleece product that I like quite a bit. Um, and that serves as my expedition weight long john. So this is a lightweight long john, expedition weight long john, and a pair of soft shelled pants. And I would probably be wearing uh, just this soft shelled pants with maybe a long john, and then the next item for 90% of my time on the mountain. I have a pair of Gore-Tex overpants. My favorite pair of Gore-Tex overpants was actually the Outdoor Research Mentor pant before it became bibs and had, uh, now it comes up quite high and it's a lot heavier and a lot more bulky. Uh, my new favorite are this, this pair of Arcteryx. They have full side zips. So if you have your Expedition boots on and crampons on, you can take these side zips, open them all the way up and put them on without taking any of your footwear off changing anything else about the way you're um, dressed. And then in really cold conditions or around camp in the evening time, I also have this pair of puffy pants. Uh, there's a lot of really awesome downfilled pants. It's super important with downfilled pants that they have side zips. If you have full side zips, that's great. This pair came from Nepal where I do a lot of work um, and I, I really love them. This is by a company called Alpine Designs. And we'll probably be offering these for sale in our shop and near our adventures in the coming year. And they're a very affordable, really awesome uh, down pant that folds up really small and goes in a small stuff sack like that. Okay, um, we'll take a look at what I'm wearing on the upper body before we go down in the footwear, which is super important. So, for my uh, outer layer, I have a Packlight Gore-Tex jacket. You can get away with anything that's waterproof and somewhat breathable. Some people will do like a ultralight outdoor research shell or camp, make some super lightweight shells. Those are fine, just make sure you treat them with um, Nick Wax or some other waterproofing product as well as your Gore-Tex items before you go out into the expedition. You really don't want something worn out because again, you can get rain, not just snow. These usually work best in uh, snow conditions because there's an opportunity for evaporation to take place but make sure that they're they're uh, well waterproofed and then it's also super important that whatever you bring can vent really well Gore-Tex active products tend to vent better but they wet out a little faster you can kind of take your pick um, then I have an expedition parka and this is the mountain hardware nihilus jacket it's 850 filled down has a waterproof zip has a uh, semi waterproof outer that's also breathable. I find this does a pretty good job of stopping wind and it's not the warmest of expedition parkas out there. Certainly Feathered Friends makes some much warmer parkas that are gonna guarantee to keep you warm, especially in early season conditions. But later in the year when I tend to be climbing, that's like late May through um, mid June or even early July, this is enough, especially if you have other layers that are going underneath it. And I make sure that I bring a stuff sack, the waterproof stuff sack that I stuff that into. So if I'm pulling everything out of my bag, I can just throw it in the snow and not worry about getting saturated, even if it's raining outside, it goes into that. Those, these Sea to Summit stuff sacks, by the way, are awesome. They're super lightweight, they're incredibly durable, um, and they, they compress things down well. 
Next I have a synthetic filled Rab Xenon jacket. Uh, I like synthetic fill closer to me because as I'm working hard, all that uh, vapor from my body and cellular respiration passes through garments and can wet out down material a little bit more easily, but the synthetic material doesn't soak it up quite as much and then it evaporates off a little easier. Uh, this is a really warm for its weight as well, this wrap product. Beneath that I have a fleece jacket by Marmot. It's a hybrid, so it has a little bit of synthetic fill insulation around the, the chest area. The back it doesn't because you'll have your backpack pressing against your back. You want that to be breathable. And this is all uh, Polar Tech Wind Pro fabric, which does a good job of uh, blocking a little bit of wind, not a lot, but a little bit, and remaining very breathable. So if I'm working really hard without these other jackets on, a lot of that vapor that we're talking about and that sweat can evaporate off and not soak me out. And then as my base layer, I have a, a Marmot product. It works like a sun shirt, but it can vent really well, open up and it has a very light grid fabric on the inside, so it stays reasonably warm, but even in warmer conditions with that venting, it allows me to um, adjust pretty well to conditions. Um, so that's what I'm wearing on my upper body. We'll look at my head. On the West Buttress route, not everyone will bring a helmet. There's a, a, just a few areas in the West Buttress route where there are hazards coming from above, like around Windy Corner where you could have rock fall, for instance. Um, or small amounts of ice that are blowing off the ridge above you. And most guiding companies will have a helmet. Um, also on the fixed lines, if someone were to slip and fall or someone above you were to drop something, pieces of ice or a carabiner were to fall down, you might want to have a helmet. If you do bring a helmet, a couple things to consider. Lightweight is super important, but the lighter weight your helmet, the easier it is to break, which isn't generally a concern, except that you're gonna be packing things into duffel bags, they're going to airplanes and they can easily get broken in your luggage. So keep that in mind. You might want to keep that in your carry-on. And the color doesn't matter that much really, but I like light colors again because it reflects heat. And again, strangely, you can get overheated on the glacier just as easily as you can get freezing cold sometimes. I have a very lightweight hat. This is a Mountain Hardware product. It's micro fleece. It fits really well underneath the helmet. It's tight. Uh, another thing to keep in mind with hats is you want something that's comfortable pulled down over your eyes like that because in Alaska in the summertime it's always light it never gets dark and some people will bring you know specific covers for their eyes but I try to minimize the amount of things that I bring um, and I find that can just get lost in my luggage so uh, just having a comfortable hat that can pull down over my eyes and is really breathable so when I'm working hard that sweat again can evaporate it's helpful. A buff, lots and lots of uses for a buff. Solar protection, you can pull it up and over your mouth and your nose and re-breathe some of that vapor um, that you're exhaling and that keeps your lungs and your inner body a lot warmer and less dry. Super helpful. And then I have uh, another outdoor research hat. This is a Peruvian hat. It's a uh, windstopper fabric and this can layer over my micro fleece hat, and that makes it very, very warm to wear around base camp. So I can work with those hats actually as a layering system as well. I have a sun cap, very lightweight, weighs almost nothing. This stays on the entire time that I'm out there. And a lot of people will wonder, well, why do you have a sun hat but nothing to cover the back of your neck? My sun shirt has a hood, and I found that using a sun shirt with a hood coupled with a baseball cap does a much, much better job of protecting my body from sun than one of the hats with the little tail that, that can actually blow around and flap around. Because this covers my ears really well, everything all the way down the back. There's no way that can, sun can hit. And when you're out on the glacier, that's a big concern. For balaclavas, there's lots of different models to choose from. I really like this lightweight version by uh, Black Diamond. Um, the things I like about it is you can put it on like a neck tube and pull the top off and it's still really comfortable. You can slide this up. Um, this can add a lot of warmth to your hat system as well and it has sort of a grid fabric inside so it breathes super well. It's a little bit wind stopping on the outer but it's not going to be nearly as good as some of the more specific wind, stop, wind stopper uh, products uh, but I find that it's warm enough especially when it's combined with um, this face mask that can go right around the back of my neck as well. And that's made out of a windstopper fabric. So combining those two together does a really good job in the event that we get really high winds. That's mostly for 17,000 feet and above. And then 
I have a pair of Jilbo sunglasses. These are uh, photochromatic with camel lenses so they can adjust to light conditions. And this is something that I overlooked the first time I went to Denali. But with the clouds coming in and out and the route finding and the need to route find in those different conditions, having something that works well in low light is actually super important. Especially because a lot of the travel that you do on the lower glacier is safest to be done at night. And even though it's light at night, it's, it's still darker. So it's kind of like traveling at twilight or around sunset the whole time. And if you're in a cloud, that means you don't have that much visible light. So it's important to have a lens that gets light. You could also use zebra lenses or just a light colored lens in general. And my goggles, something else I overlooked. If you're out finding and it's negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit, negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit, there could be a lot of vapor in the air. You could be passing through a cloud. Your lenses can freeze really easily, especially if they don't vent well. So these are aerospace model photochromatic zebra light lenses, so they open up really well, they vent super well. So my lenses won't freeze and get covered, which can actually turn into almost a survival situation where you can't see and you're wandering through whiteout conditions in crevasse terrain, very dangerous. Um, really light colored lenses, these get almost trans just transparent with very little tint, but then exposed to light and they darken very rapidly, so they're suitable even in high light conditions. And, um, I really love these things. These are amazing on Denali in the past year and a half. Okay, so that's those. And then there's my headlamp. Again, you have light all the time. So the primary use of the headlamp is to shine it in your backpack to look around for things. Or if you're unlucky enough to fall into a crevasse, to use it in that crevasse to find your way out. So this Mammut model takes a single battery inside. I put lithiums inside. They do much better in cold. And, uh, it's surprisingly bright for its size, and you put it in your pocket so you always have it with you in the event you do fall into a crevasse. Sunscreen, super important stuff. The best sunscreen that I've found so far is ThinkSport. ThinkSport rubs in really well, and it is 20% zinc oxide. Super important to find something that's a physical barrier like zinc or titanium oxide, and for whatever reason, Think Sport, I found it stays better. A lot of the physical blockers, after just scuffing up against your arm and things like that, they will wear off a little bit faster. But this does a really good job of protecting your skin. You still need to apply it really often. Uh, you don't need nearly as much as this for Denali, which might surprise you. But this is, I think, a one and a half ounce tube. I'll empty this of its original sunscreen and I'll fill it with this sunscreen. Um, and you might need two of those per person. So three ounces per person is enough sunscreen for a 24 day expedition because you really only have maybe your hands at times and your face uh, exposed. So you don't have that much surface area. Okay, we'll get into some of the equipment. Oh, actually, let's go down to the footwear here. One of the most important pieces, footwear. The importance of a good boot on Denali cannot be overstated. Uh, Right now, it's becoming more and more of a standard for people to use 8,000 meter boots, which are a type of double boot, meaning there's two boots, an inner boot and an outer boot that also has an incorporated gaiter. An 8,000 meter boot is different than a 6,000 meter boot. 8,000 meter boot is for colder conditions. And it's important if you do to decide to use an incorporated boot that has a gaiter that's a part of it. It's an 8,000 meter boot rather than a 6,000 meter boot if you want to go without these guys. Okay? Um, this is an overboot, which I'll talk about in a moment. <coughs> this particular model, La Sportiva boot, climbs super well. This is the Spantic, so I like it because I can climb technical routes with it, crampons. Um, accepts full automatic crampons as long as there is not a overboot on it. Uh, the lacing system works reasonably well. It's kind of a unique lacing system and it's really warm. Uh, however, it's not warm enough to be used without overboots. The overboots that I recommend, there's only two types. They're from the same company. They are 40 below and you could either use the K2 Super Lights or you could use the 40 below Purple Haze, which is what I have here. One has a, I think it's a Cordura Gator and it still has a neoprene lower and these are full neoprene so they're a little bit warmer and they have a big zipper here that makes it really easy to zip and unzip uh, the product to get your boots in and out. Usually I'm only using these in really cold conditions, generally above 14,000 feet and more commonly above 17,000 feet, just for summit day. And every other, every other time on the mountain, I'm just using these boots when I'm going. I like to bring one or two pair of insole warmers 
and these are made to work well in low oxygen conditions once they're opened up. So they'll work in the bottom of your boot and they go on the bottom, uh, right in the sole. That's different than the toe warmers that have a sticky backing that are designed to kind of be stuck underneath here. And those commonly give people blisters. Um, I'm only using these maybe one or two days of the whole climb, usually just the summit day, and that's it. Um, maybe there is a particular windy day or cold day around windy corner or something like that. On the way down even, I hadn't used them. But generally, I'm, I only bring one or two pairs. Some people get really carried away with hand warmers and foot warmers. For hand warmers, I also carry a few. I usually carry maybe four pairs of hand warmers max. But if you start carrying more, you're just adding weight, and generally you don't end up even using them if you have good care with your hands. For socks, I like to bring ski socks um, that are nice and long. I learned a lot about socks as well. I was bringing too many pairs of socks on my first expedition. Um, here I showed two pairs. I would bring two to, to four pairs maximum. Um, and the reason I like ski socks is they come up high in your shins that adds warmth to your whole foot, uh, but it also protects your shin from shin bang. If you look at my shin here, that's from a, an alpine trip I had recently. I work in the Northwest as an alpine guide. And so the, sh the shin takes a beating from the boot rubbing against it. You can imagine if you're climbing this peak for 18 days, the amount of rubbing that would happen on your shin from the boot could really cause a lot of damage and really hurt. So having a long sock with some padding is helpful. Uh, gaiters, most people are also bringing gaiters. These are uh, Gore-Tex gaiters by Outdoor Research, really great product. Um, that'll help keep uh, snow out of your boots. It also helps keeps your, your feet warmer. Some people, especially guides, are doing away with gaiters because a lot of pants uh, certain types of pants will have a cinch at the bottom or a lot of overpants have a cinch at the bottom. Just depends on what your preferences are, whether you want to bring gaiters or not. One thing that gaiters do is they also protect you from snagging your overpants with your crampons and things like that by tucking everything in. So if your pants flare out like a lot of Gore-Tex ski pants at the bottom, you might consider putting gaiters over everything to cinch it all in. Um, otherwise, you might decide to go without. All right, let's take a look at some of the gear. Stoves. This is probably the most talked about piece of equipment for Denali. Most expedition companies are using white gas stoves. Uh, the MSR XGK is probably the stove of choice or has been the stove of choice for a lot of expeditions for a long time on Denali in the United States. If you're not a US citizen or if you're just more familiar with the Primus products, uh, then this product, which is the uh, Primus version of the XGK, I guess you could say. It's a Himalaya Expedition stove. Um, I personally really like because it's mostly metal parts, including the pump. You can see that's almost all metal with just a couple pieces of plastic, which seems to hold up a lot better than the uh, MSR pumps, which in extremely cold conditions, plastic gets more fragile and is more likely to crack. I would say the XGK performs a little bit better in terms of heat output than this product. Um, I've had success with both. I've used both up there. A new standard on the mountain uh, is becoming more and more common, and I would probably switch to this next time, is um, a different MSR product, and that's the MSR reactor stove. And now, you've probably heard a lot about um, different fuel types performing differently in cold temperatures, and particular isobutane stoves not performing very well in cold weather, and that is absolutely true. Once you get below about 25 degrees Fahrenheit, Isobutane uh, starts to work, or it's, it becomes more and more liquidy and doesn't operate as much as burning a gas. So it doesn't burn cleanly and you'll get a lot of yellow flame and a really inefficient burn. But there's easy ways to overcome that and one way to overcome that is to simply take a bowl like this. This is actually my eating bowl anyway, so I have it out with me. It weighs nothing and you can pour a little bit of water in there, lukewarm. It just has to be above freezing and you can set the canister pour your canister stove in that, and that heats up the canister stove to make it burn more efficiently, warm up a little bit more water, dump in warm water into that bowl, and you can actually burn really efficiently. And in general, uh, the isobutane stoves burn more efficiently and at higher heat, especially when you're dealing with something like a reactor, than a white gas stove. Big drawback, a big disadvantage, is the canisters themselves. They take up a huge amount of volume in a pack 
or in a sled. So those are commonly used by people doing technical routes or lighter and faster trips, and they're much more expensive. We're looking at between five and eight ounces of fuel per person per day.